Hey, that was some singing. Now, you may have thought, uh, looking at that slide, that when I came up here to talk, it had absolutely nothing to do with this sermon. But I'm telling you that it does. Uh, I think that there is a connection and something very similar about the prayers that we pray to our God and the praises that we sing to our God. Both of them are a communication to Him and they both function in a very similar way. And I may be wrong for assuming it, but if you're anything like me, sometimes as I sing these songs, I quit paying attention to the words that I'm singing. And here's the reason that it happens, at least for me. I grew up in the church. I have been to church every Sunday of nearly my entire life. And these songs that we sing, they're, they're a part of the very fabric of who I am. When I pass away, they will sing my favorite songs probably at my funeral. These songs are part of, of who I am. And I take these uh, things for granted. And I think a lot of times we do the exact same thing with our prayers. This happens in a couple of ways. Here's the first way that it happens. Here comes Brother Glover. And everybody knows there's a crowd. When Brother Glover comes up here to pray, there's a collective sigh. Because we know that when Brother Glover prays, that we're going to have to preach, or the preacher's going to have to preach about 10 minutes shorter. Because if he doesn't, we ain't going to beat the Baptist to lunch this Sunday. So he better, Spencer better be shorter this Sunday. Day, right? We, we know that guy. And he's going to go. Now here's the problem with that. When you do that, you have already decided in your mind that you ain't going to listen to him pray before he even got up there to do the prayer. We don't sometimes pay attention not only to our songs in communication to our God, but also to our prayers in communication to our God. There's a second way that this happens. The second way is this time not on behalf of the person offering uh, or the listening and praying with the prayer, but this time it's the prayer himself. Maybe you've got a routine, and, and don't get me wrong, routines are, are good things, especially spiritual routines. But you pray this prayer every day before you eat your meal with your family. Everybody sits around that table and that's great unless your daughter can pray that prayer along with you in the exact same cadence with the exact same words and pause where you pause because you pray the same prayer every time you pray. Church, here's what I want to know. Are we even paying attention to the things that we pray when we pray those prayers? Are we paying attention to these songs when we communicate to our God? I think there's a connection here. And I think that we're not the only church that has, has noticed and, and this kind of thing has happened to. I want you to look with me before we even get to our text to James chapter 4 verses 2 through 3. James 4, verses 2 through 3. Let's read this text together. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Who? God. You ask God, but you don't receive because you ask Him wrongly so that you can spend it on your passions. Church... These people had forgotten the power of the prayer. They had let their prayer life become non-existent. And even when they weren't praying, they weren't praying for the right reasons. Let me tell you what it was like. They looked at their prayer life like they looked like a genie in the bottle. And they would keep God off in the corner. And when they needed something, they take that bottle out, they rub it, and poof! They'd hope that their desires came true. But that's not the way prayer works. Prayer works through years. And you know why prayer works through years? It's because prayer is a relationship with your God. There's a TV show right now, and it's called Married at First Sight. I don't know if you've seen this show. I do not suggest that you do uh, what they do in this show, because I don't know if they've had a single successful marriage come out of it. But this is what they do in the show. And Married at First Sight, 
they have a team of professionals and analytics on some computer and they match you with the absolute best partner that you could possibly get and you don't know the person until you see them and they meet you and your entire family and their entire family on your wedding day do you know how long me and Madison dated before we got married Four years to the day. Four years to the day. We dated so long and had known everything about each other and asked every question we could have developing a relationship. And then when we got married, we found out we didn't know anything about each other anyway. <laughs> Prayer works a lot like that. Communication with your God works a lot of the same way. You spend years and years and years developing your relationship with your God and then something happens. Something that you didn't see coming and you pray to your God and buddy you thought you knew him and then you pray a prayer for somebody about something that you haven't ever prayed and maybe you don't get the thing that you want in the way that you want it but God's going to answer that prayer and even though it hurts that you weren't given that thing and you know what it is for you you know that everything's going to be okay because you've developed a relationship with God that is so much bigger than that one situation. That's the way prayer works. It takes years because it's a relationship. It's not a genie in the bottle. But that's what they thought about their relationship with good with God. So I want you to look over to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, because what you're going to see is we've worked all the way through James. This is the final sermon in James. And before James, y'all ain't going to be able to read that. You are going to have to get out your Bibles. And right as James finishes this book, he's going to give them one last message. He's going to say, please commit, be a people of what? Prayer. So let's look at this passage together. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. And I'm going to stress the word pray any time that it's used in this text. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a very nature like ours. He was a dude like me and you. And he prayed that it would not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. The word prayer, or prayed, or praise is used six or seven times in these six verses. Prayer is used in a more condensed area right here than nearly anywhere else in the entire Bible. It, it may be the most. This church that James was writing to needed to be praying with, on behalf of, in the presence of other Christians. And they didn't even know why in the world and hadn't developed a relationship with their God to even think that their prayers mattered. And church, what I want to know is if this church that had the brother of Christ ministering to them struggled with thinking that their prayers was worth anything, then maybe we struggle with it too. Every line of everything that I want to say today is going to be trying to convince you that your prayers matter and that you need to be a people who identify and are identified because of their prayers. John McKnight told me a couple of weeks ago, it may have been a month ago, he said, Jonathan, how does it make you feel to know 650 people are praying for you to leave? And I said, it makes me feel good because the, the whole reason I'm here is to leave, you know? You're praying for me to be successful. You want me to leave here and go and do great things for the kingdom. You are raising me up to be a minister. And to have that many people praying for me, that means a lot. There are certain people who pray for my ministry daily. Madison's grandfather is one of those people. And I think it's why James rests the whole section, this whole section, he rests it on verse 16. And you can look at it. He says, the prayer of a righteous man has great power as it's working. 
So today as I pray, I'm trying to tell you that your prayers matter. That you want to talk about commitment, that's the theme for this year. There ain't nothing you can commit better to than a, to be a people of prayer. That's what I want to stress to you. What does it take to be a person of prayer? So here's the first point. Our identity should be a, a people of prayer. And a person who is a person of powerful prayer is in constant communication with their God regardless of what season of life he's in. I started this sermon out with a, a, a song. And you may have thought, well, why are we even starting with a song if, if the sermon is about prayer? But I think the idea of song and prayer are, are really connected. I think it's something that James talks about in this section also. I think it's something you can pay attention to. So look back up at verse 13 and 14 one more time. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray. James is connecting these two things. He puts worship right in between these two necessary things of prayer. Prayer, worship, praise, and prayer. They all go together. And it's an idea that's expressed in Scripture over and over and over again. So we're going we're gonna to play a game. The name of this game is, is it a song or is it a prayer of thanksgiving? Is it a song or is it a prayer of thanksgiving? Here's the way it works. I'm going to read two verses. They both fall in the same category. And I want you to raise your hand with me and actually tell me if you don't, it's going to be lame. Really work with me here. Say, is this a song or is this a prayer? So here are the two verses. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. So that's the first one. Be thinking about what you think that is. Here's the second one. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord, so my soul thirsts for you. Okay, how many people think that those are uh, songs? Raise your hand. How many people think that those are prayers? Raise your hand. Okay, uh, trick question. You probably know it. They are both. It was originally a prayer prayed to somebody's God that later became a song. And, and I told you in this intro to this sermon, I said, look at your song books. Those were originally prayers to somebody's God that later became made into songs. That's the way our things go. You can pray through every line of these prayers. And James says in verses 13 through 14, these are connected things. These are very connected things. And I think it's interesting. He says this negative thing. When you're suffering, pray. When you're cheerful, sing praise. When you are sick, back in that valley again, let the elders come to you and let them pray on your behalf. It looks as if no matter where you find yourself in life, if you find yourself in a valley, if you find yourself on the mountain peak, no matter where it is, you need to be in communication with your God. There is not a situation in your life where you shouldn't be in communication with your God. And I think that we absolutely can sing praise even when we're suffering. And just as the opposite, I think that we can uh, sing praise, we can pray even when we're cheerful. That's the way this thing works. It goes uh, both ways. And that's the kind of people that we need to be. Spencer describes it as a guitar. It's the thing that I've heard him describe it as. Why do you think he talks about the need for us to pray twice, but he only tells us we need to, to praise once? I think it's because oftentimes, long before we quit praising, we have quit praying a long time ago. Spencer says it's a guitar. You've got three strings, and I know the guitar's got more than three strings. This is for, for the sake of an example. One string is the spiritual disciplines. 
one string is uh, worship and, and meeting with the other saints. And the, the last string is prayer to our God. And if any one of those strings go, it definitely is detrimental to the rest of the song. You can't play the song without the other two strings. But oftentimes what has happened is we'll see, and you can only see the final string go. That's the worship string. But the fact of the matter is, is usually the other two strings have popped. Prayer has gone a long time ago. We need to be a people of praise and communication with our God. And we need to be a people of prayer no matter what situation we find ourselves in life. Do not stop that communication. Point number two. A person of powerful prayer is a person who knows that God can do amazing things through his prayer. I want you to look with me to James chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. Uh, let's look there. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a very nature like ours. He was just like me and you. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not give rain on the earth. Do you see the example that James uses of a man just like me and you so that we can continue to pray? He uses the example of Elijah. Here's the problem with that. I don't know if you've read the Bible lately, but Elijah don't look like like a guy just like me and you. Elijah's special. There are two people in the Bible who don't die, but instead just go straight to heaven. Do you know who they are? Eni and Elijah. Elijah. But he's just a man, just like me and you. And we can pray just like Elijah does. Here's another thing. The Mount of Transfiguration. Christ goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go with him. They go up and they see three Bible people on the top of that mountain. The first of them is Moses. Have you heard of Moses? He's a really important Bible guy. He represents all of the law. And then there's a second person. You know who that is? Elijah. This guy that we can be just like Elijah. He is the second person because he represents all of the prophets. And the third is Christ. The fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He's a guy just like me and you, your prayer life should just be like that of Elijah. Now, I'm sorry, but to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Couldn't he have used a better example? Maybe Rahab, but Elijah? I can't be Elijah. Christ does something interesting that's very similar to this. He's teaching his disciples and he tells them, if you just had the prayer, life, and the faith of a mustard seed, you could move that mountain. Here's the problem. What do we use to move mountains to this day? Dynamite. We don't use prayer, people. There's a reason we don't use prayer. There's a reason companies ain't hiring Christians to move mountains with prayers. It doesn't work that way. It's almost as if Christ and James are communicating the exact same message. It's like a, a, a hyperbole. You probably won't ever really move a mountain. You probably aren't ever going to really pray and it stop raining for three years and then pick back up on a dime. But there is no reason that the prayer life that you have can't be just as influential and as important to you as Elijah's was to him. A person of powerful prayer does not doubt the power that he has when he prays. The relationship that he developed that he, when he prays. Because Elijah developed the same relationship with God that you will when you pray. And the third one. A man of powerful prayer is praying for, with, and in the presence of other Christians. I want you to look with me to James chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. James 5, go to 14 and then skip to 16. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Skip to verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
In verse 14, and I thought about not preaching it because it's, it's a difficult thing to talk about because we don't see it often. James talks about the sprinkling of oil that's supposed to aid in the healing of somebody. It's something that we don't see often anymore. I've seen it one time, and that was at my home congregation. We had a deacon come forward, and he was about to go have heart surgery. So he asked for the elders to anoint him with oil. They had to have known prior because they had oil on them. And I don't bring... Do you bring oil to church? I don't. They had, I don't know, olive oil with them, and they anointed this person. This is a scriptural thing. This is something we could do. If you are somebody who is, is in a rough spot, and you feel like this is what you need... And you want to ask the elders for that? If we want to stand on Scripture and live by what it says, you can ask that because it's in the Bible. It's a scriptural thing. But I want you to realize something that even these Christians realized. They didn't believe that it was in the power of the oil that was going to heal them from their sickness. And I'll, I'll prove my point to you. When James writes these verses, how many times does he write, pray for one another? Within six verses, how many times? Seven times. How many times does he say, anoint with oil? One time. They knew and had faith in the power of their God through prayer, more so than the oil. Here's another example. As James writes to these Christians and he tells them, hey, put oil or ointment on somebody, oil was a medicine during the day. It was what they did. If you had a cut on your arm, you balmed it up. You put oil on it. You oiled somebody. You, you lubricated them. You massaged them, right? You, you healed them in that sense. What James is saying is get that person the best physical help you can give them and give them the best spiritual spiritual help that you can give them in, in prayer. And that's on behalf of the elders of the church. That's what that oil does. But here's what I want us to pay attention to in these verses. Look at verse 14 one more time and I want you to see what I'm stressing here. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. What do you have to do when somebody calls to you? What do the elders do in response? They come. It wasn't the sick man going to the elders and saying, say this prayer for me and anoint me with oil. No. Instead, that sick man who could not go, they came to him. That's what you do. You go. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another. What do you have to do to confess to somebody? You have to go. Listen, you can pray for somebody over a phone call or you can pray with them without them around, but ain't nobody writing somebody a text message or a letter to confess their sins. Instead, you go. Parker Willis, the youth intern who was here this summer. Me and Parker talk once a week on the phone and we talk about the struggles that we're having in our lives, the tough sins that we struggle with, and Parker knows all of mine, and we pray for one another as we battle those sins. But if you ask Parker or me, we'll both tell you that the best prayers that we've ever had for one another, the most meaningful ones, were never the ones that we prayed over the phone. They were the ones that we prayed for these teens at this church and each other. And we were the ones that we had youth devos in our dorm rooms at Harding. Those were the ones where we were together. There is something to being in the presence of somebody and praying for them. The ladies' ministry that you do here where you text, I think the men would be wise to do the exact same thing because that prayer ministry is a valuable thing. But here's, here's a problem that happens a lot of times. I more so see the problem on Facebook. You say, I've got this struggle. Or my favorite one is the, um, I've got an unspoken prayer request where you don't want to tell everybody, but you want them to pray, but it's not, what do I pray for if I don't know what you're struggling with? Anyway. They have that prayer request and you'll get a list a mile long of people that are going to pray. But ain't nobody going to... Do, do people really stop and pray? Here's my... Call 
call to you. I'm trying to encourage you to do this. If somebody tells you they need a prayer, why not stop with that person right then and pray with them in the presence for, with that person? Because there's something to being in the presence of that other person. Pray with them right there. These are the three things that I believe a person of powerful prayer is involved with. I think that you need to be in the presence of another person because I think it's vitally important, and I can't stress enough, the power of being in the presence of somebody praying. I think that a person of powerful prayer is a person who is um, in prayer regardless of what season of life they are in. I think that these are the things that a Christian does. And I want to encourage you to do these things this week. There are a couple of ways that you can make yourself do it. One challenge is to actually stop when you say you're going to pray for somebody and, and do it right then and there. I had a lady after worship the first time. She says, when I get these emails from Miss Levon that she sends out, I stop what I'm doing right there, wherever I am, and I pray for those people in that moment because if I don't, I won't. I think that's a good thing. Another thing you could do is get a prayer journal and write those prayers down. Make yourself do it because I believe, you want to talk about who your identity is? You are the people of prayer. Now, if you struggle with this and you know, look, I struggle with this and I haven't been praying the way that I ought to, then why don't you do us a favor and let, and let the elders, the people who want to pray over you, let them do what they're here for. Let them pray for you and encourage you to help your spiritual life. Whatever your need may be, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Almost persuaded.